okay? And uh, can everyone see the slides okay? I mean, the colors, the colors come and go. Hopefully, you know, you don't want to look too much at the slides. Hopefully, you'll, look, you'll listen to me more than you look at the slides. All right, so let's start with 1985, the year of the spy. This is a little bit of a misnomer. That's actually what the press called it, 1985, the year of the spy. That's where that term comes from. If you're looking at a Time Magazine cover. If I go on to the next slide here. Okay, it's actually the decade of the spy. And again, I don't know how well you can see this, but the time period we're talking about here is 1975 to 2008. And from 1975 to, 2000 to 1979, there were a total of eight spy cases in those four years. But look at the 1980s. Look what happens there in the middle 1980s. 1983, 10, 1984, 11, 1985, 12. I actually saw 14 for 1985 as well. Then there's a little bit of a drop. And then you have 1988, 1989 happening. <coughs> So clearly something was happening in, in, during this time period. Now look further, and again, I don't know how well you can see this. From 1990 to 2008, the most you had in any one year was seven. That happened twice. And in 2002, there wasn't a single case. So something weird is happening during the 1980s, and we're gonna talk about what that was. All right, now how do you make the list? That's the year of the arrest or when it was publicized. In other words, you know, when it went to trial, when these people were went to court. So that's basically, you know, what I'm going to be covering today. And by the way, because I knew I was going to ask questions on this, you know, what's happened since 2008, we really don't have that information, at least not available, available publicly. We certainly have had, we've certainly have had spy cases during that time. But as far as I can tell, we don't have numbers anywhere near what happened in the 1980s. Okay. Everyone with me so far? No. Okay, good. All right, what's up? All right, let me come clean and tell you that we don't have a good answer for what happened in the mid-1980s that caused all these spying cases. Uh, I did a lot of research on this, and I couldn't find one good answer. I'll give you my theory in a little bit, but just let me tell you about Cold War politics, because that had a lot to do with it. This is the 1980s. President Reagan, he's our president at the time, 1981 to 1989. Reagan was a Cold War warrior, spent a lot of money on national defense. That's when I was in the Army. I remember that very well. Some of us remember Star Wars, you know, the, strate the strategic defense initiative to shoot down the Soviet missiles when they're in plate. You know, he spent a lot of money. So that was the kind of atmosphere that you had. In contrast, you had the Soviet Union. Things are starting to unravel. In Poland, you have Lech Walesa, and you have Solidarity, the first independent labor movement. The Soviet Union is starting to lose control of its uh, colonies, if you want to call them that, their satellite countries. We have the arrival of Mikhail Gorbachev, who basically decides he wants to you know, move the Soviet Union in a different direction. Some of us remember Glasnost which is, you know, liberalization, more friendliness towards the West, perestroika, which is some kind of restructuring of the Soviet system. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of background that we have here. So that's basically what is going on here. Now, let me give you my opinion on why we had so much trouble during this time period, or why there are so many spies. Basically, how are spies caught? There's one major way. Basically, does anyone... By the way, you know, feel free at any time to chime in and comment on this. There's one major way. Basically, someone turns them in. Defectors. Whenever you have a defector or someone turns, they always name names. And one of the things you're going to learn from this is that some, several of these people were caught because someone turned them in. So that's an important factor right there. So during the 1980s, the mid-1980s, I would argue that counterintelligence was very effective. We were very good at catching people or convincing you know, them to turn over, come, on, come and work, on, work for us and name names, things like that. The Stillwell Commission was created to deal with the issue of spying, and in particular, one case, which I'll get to in a minute, the Walker case. But the Stillwell Commission was created. 
Whenever you have a problem like that, you always, the government always tends to create a commission to look at things. This was named after Richard Stilwell, who was a general, an army general, and as a trivia item, his father was Vinegar Joe Stilwell from World War II, the famous China, Burma, India theater commander. Okay, so the Stilwell Commission was looking at the Walker case and its spying in general, and they came up with some recommendations, which I'm going to go over. There's a whole list of them, but I'm just going to hit on a few. For one of the first things that they said was that we need to do a better job with polygraphs, you know, lie detectors. If you've ever had a clearance, sooner or later, you're going to get a lie detector test. And, I mean, I've been working, you know, with... Uh, for NSA since 1988, and prior to that I was in the Army, where I had my first lie detector test. You're supposed to get those, you know, aperiodically, but the problem is sometimes you'll go like 20 years without ever getting one. And then you'll also have situations where people will have a lie detector test every two, three years. So, you know, people are going to fall through the cracks, so they recommended that they need to do a better job with polygraphs. Uh, yes, sir? Sure, I don't want to get heavy, but we're not focused on any one country, are we? There was, there's got to be more than one country you're talking about. Yeah, we're going to cover a whole bunch of them. I think I'm anticipating your question. Right. And you'll see as we go through that a number of countries are involved. Now, if I don't answer your question, let me know. Okay, so a more aggressive approach towards polygraphs. Okay, another thing is a security agreement. If you handle classified material, you're supposed to have a security agreement. Basically, what it does is it gives you accountability. In other words, you know, you signed your name, you're responsible. They stopped doing that for a while. So the Steelwell Commission recommended that we bring it back. Another thing they did was they created a special research organization, and I want to make sure I have the exact title correct. It's the Defense, this is the Department of Defense, the Defense Personnel Security Research Center out in Monterey, California. That was created. The reason for that was to deal with Department of Defense personnel security reasons. And then the last one that I want to mention was the National Defense Ar the National Security Archive, excuse me, at George Washington University. This was created because the American public is all of a sudden wondering what's going on here, because a lot of these ended up in newspapers. So the National Security Archive was created for the public at George Washington University. So that's the Stillwell Commission. Okay, reasons for spying. Every one of us, I'm guessing, has seen a whole bunch of spy movies and, you know, probably more television shows about, you know, espionage and things like that than you can count. So you know about this already. Okay, money is obviously the main one, and I'll talk about that. But let's start with ideology. Ideology is important. Okay? There are people that just, and I'm talking about the United States here, that just didn't like American policy for whatever reason. And in some cases, and this happened recently, uh, I think she was in the Air Force and maybe it was in the Army. Her name was Reality Winner. She didn't like President Trump's policies. So basically, she decided she'd leak information. Okay, the problem with that is that you decide for yourself what's best for everyone else. That's the problem. And once you do that, you also lose control of the information. You don't know who's going to get it. I'll talk about that a little later on as well. So ideology is important. Revenge. We're going to talk about one case where revenge was the factor. This guy was mad at the CIA. He's going to teach him a lesson. Then another one is just the thrill. You know, there are some people that just really get into being a spy, double agent, or triple agent, whatever. But the big one is money. Money is the big one. Every case we're going to look at, there was money. Even the people that did this for ideological reasons did it for money. What a surprise. You know, they, they don't like the United States. They love the Soviet Union. Guess what? They'll take money from the Soviet Union. Some of them got to be pretty rich. Interestingly, some of the people as well were not necessarily anti-United States, anti-patriotic or anything like that. They were just in a world of hurt financially. So they needed this money. I'm certainly not defending it, but I'm explaining what's going on. Okay, so let's look at these cases. 
And there is going to be a 1985 connection to every one of these. Every one of them will be a 1985 arrest until, unless I tell you otherwise. And I'm also going to bring up a few cases you've never heard of. Some are very popular, some are very well known, and others are rather obscure. Again, everyone's with me so far? Okay, let me know if you can hear me all of a sudden. All right, John Anthony Walker, family and friends. This is the granddaddy of them all. Just a show of hands, how many of you have heard of Walker? A lot of you have. Okay, he did a lot of damage. Okay, according to the KGB, the Walker ring was one of the greatest, if not the greatest, coup of the KGB. Walker spied from roughly 1967 to 1985, and it's been estimated that roughly one million documents were passed to the Soviet bloc. Well, during, you know, as, as part of uh, his, his efforts at espionage, okay? Uh, so he did, he did a lot of damage. And he was in the Navy, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a couple of minutes. But it's been estimated that had we gone to war with the Soviet Union in the 1980s, at least as far as our ability with, to fight with submarines and things like that, we would have had a lot of trouble. So he did a lot of damage. Okay, a little bit about him. Walker did not start off, did not start out to be a spy, but he ran into financial problems, real serious financial problems. So roughly 1967, 1968, he starts working for the Soviet Union. He eventually became a warrant officer in the Navy, which is you know, pretty high. You know, that's where, when, when he retired. He retired in 1976. He has a problem now when he retires. What is that problem? lack of access he no longer has access to classified materials he's got a good thing going here so what does he do he recruits his family members nice guy and it gets worse okay that's his brother arthur older brother by the way arthur was a navy uh, commander an officer who retired and then became a contractor he would pass on uh, ship uh, designs to the Soviet Union. He did it to help his brother. Interestingly, even though he got money, most of it went to his brother. So that's him you know, being led away. Michael, the one in the middle, his son, he was actually caught with documents. He was a model sailor. He joined in terms of, you know, he looked like he was squared away. He joined the Navy because his old man wanted him to. Basically, to spy. He came in intending to spy. The last person, Jerry Whitworth, I'll talk about him in a little bit because he's a special case. Okay, Walker was turned in by his ex wife. Some of you know the story already. His ex wife got mad at him. For one thing, he wasn't paying alimony. Secondly, he tried to recruit the daughter, and that got her mad. I think, I think there's a lesson here somewhere. <laughs> no, don't get the ex-wife mad at you. Okay. So anyhow, she turns him in. She tried to turn him in before. The FBI, they wouldn't take her seriously. Why? Because she was a drinker. So finally, you know, she was just some drunk. Finally, the FBI listened to her. And when they began to investigate, they went to NSA, and NSA was asked, you know, what do you know about this Walker guy? And NSA, you know, got some idea as to the type of stuff that he passed on to the Soviets, and they said, we've got a real problem here because this guy had all kinds of access. Okay, so Walker, basically, he gets life sentence, as does Arthur, his brother. Michael, his son, got the least amount of sentence, just a few years, he's out now. As a trivia item, Michael, this is kind of interesting. Michael was on board a ship and he had these classified documents in his locker. The guy next to him had no idea it was in there. The guy next to him, he got reprimanded by the Navy because they thought that he should have known what his neighbor was, was doing. And that's a true, true story, a trivia item. Okay, Walker decides, you know, he, he, he's finally caught Basically, there's a sting operation because, you know, they're on to him now because the wife complains. So, you know, he's caught now. He decides he's going to plea bargain. 
He's going to plea bargain in part to give his son a lesser sentence. He's also going to plea bargain to turn on Jerry Whitworth. Jerry Whitworth, and I'll talk about exactly what he did in a couple minutes, would get the longest sentence of all of them. He's still in jail now. He got 365 years. He got more than Walker. Walker, by the way, is dead, as is his brother Arthur. Now, what about Whitworth? Why was he so, so valuable? Whitworth, let me, let me give you an analogy here. Where we all know what a car is. Every one of us has, knows what a car is. Guess what? A car is wonderful. It's protection against the rain, all this other kind of stuff. But a car is not going anywhere unless you turn the key. Or, I'm, or I'm, a lot of cars nowadays, you just press the ignition button. Okay, Walker and his people gave the bad guys the car. Whitworth gave him the key. The key was extremely important. That's the thing that allows you basically to decrypt, encrypt, get access to actually understand what all this secret material means. So he did a lot of damage. Walker basically testified against him. Another thing that Whitworth did, which wasn't smart, was he basically fought it. So in other words, he decided that he would fight the charges instead of take a plea bargain like probably what he should have done. So anyhow, that's the Walker story. It's, it was pretty damaging, you know, arguably one of the worst espionage cases that we've ever had in the United States. And it was all done because one guy just needed a lot of money and decided that he would bring in family members as well. So this is as bad as it gets, all right? Let's talk about Jonathan J. Pollard. Show of hands, how many of you have heard of him? Okay, Pollard was an interesting guy. You see the Israeli flag here. Pollard worked for the Navy, and he got it into his head that Israel should see the same information that the United States sees, because Israel is a great friend of the United States. So what he decides to do is pass on information to Israel that Israel was not supposed to see. Now, why is this a problem? It's a problem because you decide for yourself what's best. In other words, there's policies in place. Jonathan Pollard knows better. He knows what Israel needs to see. Beyond this, you lose control of the information. I know I just said that. Basically, you know, once it goes to Israel, what's Israel going to do with it? The Soviet Union could get this material. So anyhow, that is his rationale. He's a great case of a, of a person who also wanted, you know, who connected the money to the ideology. Ideology was his reason, but he was not afraid of getting a little bit of money in the process. He became quite wealthy. Okay, him and his wife, Anna Henderson Pollard, were arrested trying to seek asylum. You know, they were outside the Israeli embassy in D.C. They were seeking asylum. Okay, how was Pollard called? Well, since I brought her up, just let me mention, she would get a five-year sentence. One of the things that she tried to do was sell information to China. So again, you know, she was not motivated so much by, by ideology. He would get a life sentence. But just let me, men let me mention that he was caught because he asked too many questions. Okay, If you work in the intelligence field, there's a concept out there. I don't know how many of you have heard of this called need to know. We've all heard of this. Basically, in simple English, None of your business. Okay, the left hand, the left hand does not know what the right hand is doing. That's a good thing. Information is compartmentalized. And this is the way it's supposed to work, at least in theory. If you work China, for example, you only know China. You don't know Russia or any of these other countries. Pollard was asking about areas that he really should not have been asking about. Someone got suspicious and basically turned him in. Now, that's how he was caught. Okay? Pollard, as I said before, got a life sentence from this. His wife, his ex-wife, he, he ended up divorcing her. She got five years. Pollard had friends in high places. There were people that didn't think he should be, that he should be getting the life sentence. You know, Israel is our ally, you know, stuff like this. You know, so they, he deserves better treatment. People high up in the Israeli government, for example, Benjamin Netanyahu, the name that many of you have heard of, him, they intervened on his, on his behalf. 
So he eventually was released. He did he did his time, but he never got life. He never got his life sentence. He was released, and he moved to Israel, where he's now a national hero. So that's Jonathan Pollard. Again, his motive was to help Israel, but he was not afraid of taking payments in the process. All right. So when they take payments and they go to jail, what happens to the money? Does the government go in and take it away from them? No. I think it depends on the situation. I think they try. I mean, that's not my area. I mean, maybe one of you have a better answer. In some cases, the money is just gone. But, you know, there's ways to recover money. And, again, that's not really my area. Um, yeah, Jamie. Did we get anything good in exchange for releasing him? Like, like releasing somebody of ours or anything like that? Not him, but there will be some trades that we'll see later on. One of the interesting things that I learned from this is that a life sentence is not a life sentence. You know, some of these people that have life sentences or long sentences, most of them never serve that full amount. Uh, Whitworth was uh, one of the few people that I know of that's actually still in jail for something he did. All right. Uh, here's the secrets that Paul had. So what kind was it about our defense systems or satellite? Yeah. Yeah. Just uh, in general, he was a Navy satellite expert. That was his area. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not really going to get into too much of the specific stuff because some of that is stuff that I really can't bring up, as you can imagine. So I tend to be kind of general on this. But yeah, he was, satellites were his area. Okay, one of our own, Ronald Pilton. A little bit before my time, uh, I joined the agency in 88. Pelton was arrested in uh, 85. Oh, and by the way, uh, Pollard was sentenced in 1985. He'd actually been arrested earlier than that. Okay, Ronald Pelton. Pelton uh, worked for NSA. He was an Air Force linguist, learned Russian, pretty good at it, pretty good at it apparently. And he eventually got to be pretty high up, meaning that he had access to a lot of very sensitive information, as you can imagine. Now, he did something that I would never recommend anyone ever do. This is unrelated to spying, by the way. He retired in bad financial in a bad financial situation. He retired in 1979, and he was in, just financially in a mess at the time. And I, I wonder to myself, why would you retire if you really can't afford it? So he spends the next two three years trying a number of things to make money. Nowhere doesn't get him anywhere. So what he does is he decides, I'm going to approach the Soviet Union. What's interesting about Pelton is he never gave a single document to the Soviet Union. It was all his memory. He remembered these projects. He remembered names. He named names. So that's basically you know, the, the story on Pelton here. Now, how was Pelton caught? If you remember what I mentioned earlier about how you're turned in, you know, defectors and things like that, the man waving, his name was Vasily Yelchenko. Okay, he was a double agent. He defected to the, you know, from the Soviet Union to the United States. Later on, he would actually redefect back to the Soviet Union. So a pretty, a very interesting guy. He remembered having dealings with an NSA -er that had red hair, but he didn't know his name. So what he does is he tells the FBI about it. The FBI contacts you know, NSA, and they eventually figure out that it's power. Power is caught in a sting operation. By the way, just because someone turns you in doesn't mean that you're going to be arrested right away. I think we've watched enough TV shows to know that. You need the evidence. So he was caught in a sting operation at the Annapolis Hilton. Okay, so basically, that's the story on Pelton. Uh, he was given a life sentence, and of course he got out, and he's now deceased. This is his letter of apology to the NSA workforce. Uh, he was before my time. He was arrested in 85. I do know people that remember him. And you can imagine they all have stories. You know, they have their favorite Pelton stories. <laughs> all right. Sharon M. Scrinade. 
This is one, has anyone heard of this case? It's, it's kind of an odd one. It's not odd so much, but it didn't make a whole lot of news. Okay, uh, Sharon M. Scrinage was a, she worked for the CIA and she was an executive assistant, I, or, you know, secretary, something along that line. And she had access to classified information. And the term is, one of the terms that they use is sex spionage, or basically honey trapping. Okay. She was in Ghana. She worked for the U.S. Embassy in Ghana. In this case, it was a CIA location as well. And this man, Michael Sasudis, you know, becomes her boyfriend. And I think you kind of know what happens next. You can read the slide here. You know that she passed on information to them. At least one person was caught. She got away with it, apparently. Until she comes back to the United States, she takes that polygraph test, and they find some inconsistencies in what she says, and that's how she's caught. So those polygraph tests, you know, they they help you in the sense of finding out, you know, what's really going on. You know, why did this person have a problem with the polygraph test? Okay, she was given five years in prison. He was given a life sentence, but because he was a diplomat, he was eventually expelled from the country. His he was related to the leader of Ghana at the time. So anyhow, that's the story on the Sharon and Scrinage. And I guess that's her mugshot, you know, smiling mugshot, you want to call it. Yes, sir. Yeah, how, how reliable are polygraph tests? Okay, that's not my area, but I can just tell you from experience. I've had like four or five of them down through the years. And, you know, they some people have a problem with them. I mean, they're just a nervous type and things like that. So they're not entirely reliable. But I think what they do is they lead to further investigation. If you, if there's something, a really good lie detector operator can pick up on things. This person is not being truthful about something. So they investigate you and it kind of goes from there. It sort of opens up a door. But as to how reliable it actually is, I don't think by itself it's that reliable. I, I think it mostly is just a, a step that leads to further investigation. That's my opinion. At least. That's not my area. Are there, yes. all, are there false negatives? Can people be trained to be the polygraph? Again, that's not really my area. I would say there are some people, though, that are just better at taking, you know, tests like that than others. I mean, I knew one person who never did pass it. Took him several tries and he eventually just decided to quit you know the working for the agency uh, and some are just better than others at basically taking them i mean again that's the best answer that i can give you it's a, it's a tool but i don't think it's the only tool all right larry wu tai chin uh one that's uh, near and dear to my heart because near and dear to my heart because my own background, I was a Chinese, I don't think I mentioned this. I was hired on by the agency as a Chinese Mandarin language analyst. That's my background. I've been an army linguist with, with a focus on China. So this is one that I have a personal interest in. Larry Wu Tai Chin was different than almost anyone that I'm going to cover for a simple reason that he was a spy from day one. He actually came in already on the, on the Chinese payroll. Okay? He actually started spying during World War II before the Chinese communists actually took control of the mainland. And he eventually would join the CIA and he'd become a translator for the Foreign Broadcast Information Service, which basically, you know, you just translating documents and things like that. He was a spy longer than anyone, even Walker. He would eventually get caught in his retirement, by the way, he thought he was home free. Okay? And Chin, Larry Wu Tai Chin, his rationale was patriotism, and that's what he said. In other words, he believed, he was a citizen of the United States, he believed that he was bringing the two countries together. That was his rationale for doing it. That having been said, he made an awful lot of money in the process. And he had a very interesting approach. Usually, you know, in this kind of work, 
you shouldn't really stand out so much in the sense that, you know, if you make $20,000 for a year and you're living in a million dollar house, that should raise red flags. You know, people look for stuff like that. You know, why does he have money that he shouldn't have? He was pretty clever about this. He was a gambler and he made everyone aware of it. Whenever he went, he'd gamble all the time. Sometimes he won and sometimes he lost. And he told people about it. So when he had this unexplained this wealth all of a sudden, people just assumed that he managed to succeed at the gambling thing. So he never, he never raised any red flags that way. Now, Larry Wu Tai Chin never spent a day in jail for a simple reason that he killed himself right before he was to be sentenced. He tried to make a deal with the CIA. By the way, he was turned in by a defector. Remember, he'd, he had already retired. So he thought he got away with it. If you can tell by looking at him there, he's pretty old there. Uh, you know, he's now in his retirement. Now, we don't know too much about what he actually passed on, but we assume it was a lot because he did it for so long. When you work for FBIS, you know, you only see a certain amount of things. So, you know, fortunately for us, he never had some of the more severe access, you know, more, more, more sensitive accesses that others would have. But we do know that he passed on information uh, to China during the Korean War, the Chinese communists about POWs. You know, some of the POWs didn't want to go back, didn't want to return to China. They wanted to be free, or they wanted to, you know, they didn't want to be repatriated. You know, he passed on those names to them. We also know that he passed on information about the United States negotiating position. Uh, when President Nixon in 1972 visited China, it's a big deal back then, they knew in advance a lot of things because of people like Larry Wu Tai Chen. And I know people that knew him. So again, this is one that's uh, you know, sort of close to home for me. He's a case that you don't hear much about, but he just spied for a long, long time. Okay, Edward Lee Howard, Sour Graves. How many of you heard of, have heard of Edward Lee Howard? Okay. This is a fairly well-known one. Apparently not well known enough. Okay, this is a guy that just got mad. And he was the first CIA agent, CIA agent that we know of that defected to the Soviet bloc. He did it because he, he lost his job. In 1983 for criminal activity, that's a little misleading in the sense that it was a number of things. He didn't, you know, he had some inconsistencies with his lie detector test. He had some drinking issues, some you know, some drug issues, a little bit of petty theft. He was upset because he got fired. He lost his job. So what does he do? He's going to get even. He tells the Soviets that his supervisor, you know, is a CIA agent. You know, his supervisor was undercover. And then, and, as, and if you're looking at the slide here, you can see that in 1984, he decided that he. He decides that he's going to sell secrets to the Soviets in Austria. <clears throat> Excuse me, I need to get a drink here. <clears throat> he was caught by Yevchenko, the, the Soviet defector, the same guy that caught, you know, that, that finger pelting. Okay, so the FBI now knows that Edward Lee Howard is working for the Soviet bloc. Okay, what he does, and here's your 1985 kind of connection, is kind of, you know, kind of interesting. It's right out of a spy novel. The FBI is monitoring his home in New Mexico. He has CIA training in terms of how to elude people, organizations, etc. He uses it his advantage to get away from the FBI. What he does is him and his wife, they get in their car, and I don't know where they're going, you know, they're heading down the road doing something. <coughs> He's in the back seat. He manages to get into the back seat. Then he jumps out the window, or you know, he jumps. They, they they open the door and he gets out. They use a dummy. The dummy's now put in the front seat. She's doing the driving, of course. The next day, the FBI, you know, picks up phone conversations from him. They're monitoring his phone. These phone conversations have been pre-recorded. So as far as the FBI is concerned, he's still there. The next thing they know, you know, he ends up in the Soviet Union. You know where he's 
As you can see, at least according to the slide here, he outed some CIA people there as well. Okay, he died in 2002. So that's basically Edward Lee Howard's story. But this was a guy that was motivated by just revenge. Did he get any money for this? Not that I know of, but I think it's highly likely. All right, uh, Randy Miles Jeffrey. Yes, Jamie. Is there any suspicion somebody tipped him off they were after him? I mean, he seems to be doing an awfully good job for, you know, like he knows he's being investigated. Uh, what are you, I mean, like, so I guess I need to be, can you yeah, be a little okay, bit more clearer on what? That defector had identified him, you know. But it kind of sounds like almost immediately he knows that they're after him. Oh, okay, I got your question. Well, you know, he's an experienced field op. I mean, he'd been in the field before, you know, these, these CIA people and others. You know, they're used to people. They're, they're, they know they're being monitored and all that other kind of stuff. I imagine that he caught on pretty so easily, pretty quickly, that they were monitoring him. You know, he's no dummy. Whenever you're, you know, you're spying like that, you're very paranoid. You know, all the time, you're, you're always looking over your shoulder. So that's the answer that I have for that. I, I, I think he probably suspected right away, you know, that they were onto him. He always figured you're going to be caught. I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah, okay. So. Uh, Randy Miles Jeffries. Okay, I don't have a picture for him. He's one of the, the minor, well, one of the lesser known cases. The general rule, if I don't have a picture, it's because I couldn't find one or else I couldn't find a picture that didn't have a copyright problem. With, uh, with the picture. Okay, Randy Miles Jeffries was a guy that worked for the Acme Company, A-C-M-E, the Acme Company, and what they, it was a company that dealt with classified materials for Congress. In this case, the House Armed Services Committee. And basically what these companies do is they handle the materials, they destroy them if they need to, or else, you know, they store them. You know, if they're, it's a, if they're a contract company and they're all cleared and all this other kind of stuff. Okay, apparently he just decided he was going to sell classified materials to the Soviets. I learned that one of his motives was that he wanted to take his wife on vacation. That was one of his motives. As you can see, he's not very good at it. Only $60 for one document. Yeah. A spy that doesn't get very much money is not very good. I mean, he could have gotten more, I'm sure, but he only got $60 for one document. Okay. As, as a trivia item, just a few months earlier, he had finished up a program where he was in rehab for drug use, and he had, like, finished the program. So he got some, you know, certification saying, good job, you know, you kicked the habit or whatever. And then a few months later, you know, he's arrested. One of the positive things that came from this, and you don't always have positives that come from these spy cases, is that they realized they needed a better system for handling these classified documents. The, the Acme company, for example, came under a lot of fire because it was way too easy for him to have access to this stuff. So, you know, they basically fixed the system, they improved it. So that was one of the good things that came out of this. And as you can see, that three to nine year sentence in 1986. Okay, Hollywood, Richard Kelly Smith. All right, Richard Kelly Smith, was an aerospace technology specialist, and he shipped Krytrons to Israel. Now, what's a Krytron? I'm no expert on it. Basically, a Krytron, there's a picture of one here, a Krytron, and maybe some of you know this better than I do. Basically, it's a tube that has gas in it, and it can trigger, supposedly, a nuclear weapon. The U.S. government has decided that it's a munition, and you're not supposed to sell it. We had a sting operation at the time called Operation Exodus, which was aimed at the Soviet Union. We wanted to stop the Soviet Union from getting these munitions, because you know, sometimes companies sell them to the Soviet Union. That's how, that's how Richard Kelly Smith was caught. Now, what's interesting here is the man there in the corner, his name is Arnon Milchon. I don't know how many, how, how many of you have heard of him, you may not have heard of him, but you, I'm sure you've heard of his film. He was a Hollywood producer. Some of his films 
have gone on to win awards. Like 12 Years a Slave, which is 2013 Academy Award winner for Best Picture. The Revenant, you know, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, 2015 Best Actor. He was the producer for those films. LA Confidential is another one. He also happens to be an Israeli agent. And that's a picture of him there. So Richard Kelly Smith uh, manages to, he's arrested in 1985, but he flees to Spain. Finally, in 2009, I'm sorry, 2001, he's extradited back to the United States. When he got back, they sentenced him to three years in jail. He was almost automatically available for parole. At the time, he was 72 years old, so he spent hardly any time in jail at all. So that's Richard Kelly Smith. And because this is Hollywood, what a surprise, there's a book. Confidential, the life of secret agent turned Hollywood tycoon Arnon Milchon. It's a wonderful story in terms, in terms of the sense that you have this Hollywood connection. And by the way, a lot of these cases have turned into Hollywood films. Uh, the Walker one, for example, became a, a film that starred Powers Booth and uh, Leslie Ann Warren. It's several years old now. It basically just was a whole Walker story. Okay, Richard Owen Buchanan. Again, I don't have a picture of him. I don't know what you want to say about this guy. I don't think he was one of the smartest guys you're ever going to run into. He, he was arrested without even having a clearance. He was in the midst of getting a clearance. And what he tries to do is to sell documents. And it wasn't even classified, documents of the Soviet bloc. He was caught in an undercover operation. And I'm not sure if, if he himself even realized that the stuff wasn't classified. He didn't have anything sensitive to sell them. He thought he did. And of course, you know, he was arrested and he got court-martialed in prison, dishonorable discharge. Uh, Air Force stuff. Richard Owen Buchanan. Yes. Yes. How do how do they just reach out and know someone over there who wants this particular? Good question. What they will do in the case of uh, in the case of a guy like Pelton, he just got on the phone and he called the Soviet embassy. You know, basically, it, it kind of depends on where you are. I'm going to be talking a, in a couple of minutes about another case where the guy basically just walked into the East German, you know, embassy and said, you know, I want to spy for the Soviet Union, or I want to spy for the East Germans. And I don't know, you know, they apparently think they're not going to be monitored or whatever. There's a little bit of luck involved. I mean, you have to... So to work sometimes, you don't always know who that POC is going to be on the other end. But then usually you have some idea. It's not like you can pick up the telephone and call, hey, you know, looking for Soviet spy in the yellow state, or, or Soviet embassy in the yellow pages, or, you know, a Soviet, you know, KGB agent in the yellow pages. Did I answer the question? Okay. Let's see. Did I? Yeah, we got him. Okay, Stephen Dwayne Hawkins and Michael Timothy Tobias. Stephen Dwayne Hawkins was in the Navy, and he created a cardinal. He, he uh, basically he decided he would have a bunch of classified materials at home. Someone, this was in Italy, by the way. He was assigned to a, a place in Italy, and he basically had made the mistake of having someone in his house that saw it and reported it. And I know we've had this in the news lately with, with, uh, with Trump and Pence and Biden. You're not supposed to have classified material at home. I think we all know that. And he was a guy, you know, that had the book thrown at him for that. Okay. He also had trouble, by the way, with the lie detector test, lie detector test Stephen Dwayne Hawkins. Michael T uh, Timothy Tobias, this is one of my favorite ones because I don't know what these people are thinking. Uh, <laughs> Michael Timothy Tobias, his job in the Navy was basically, was basically to, to handle key. And a key, if you, you remember my analogy about the car, you know how you need the key to operate the car. The key is very valuable, Navy key. It was his job to handle the key and to destroy it. But he managed to 
steel, 12 of them. And what's interesting here is that you had a system where supposedly two people are supposed to watch the material and make sure it's handled correctly. In other words, because it is sensitive, one person is responsible and the other person signs off to make sure that it was actually done. Well, apparently the, the other person never signed, you know, signed off without actually knowing. So this guy, uh, Michael Timothy Tobias, stole this material and the other guy just signed off and thought it was okay. But anyhow, uh, Michael Timothy Tobias and his nephew, his name was Fra uh, Fra uh, Frank Pizzo, P-I-Z-Z-O, what they decided to do was to go to the Soviet consulate in San Francisco and sell these keys. They weren't successful. They had a change of heart. So the next thing that they did is a thing that I just can't wrap, wrap my mind around. They approached the U.S. government, the Secret Service, and they basically told the Secret Service, hey, we've got this material. Give us amnesty or give us money or we're going to sell it to someone else. I mean, it's, I don't know how they thought they could get away with this. I mean, they're basically trying to blackmail the U.S. government. And, you know, obviously it didn't work. Okay. Uh, another part of the story here is that uh, one of his colleagues, the, the man's name was Dale Irene. Dale Irene was supposed to destroy those 12 key cards, but he didn't. He didn't destroy them. We eventually got 10 of them back. So that's Michael Timothy Tobias, his story. He got the, uh, the worst sentence. He got the 20 years, and then the others got lesser sentences. Okay, a couple more that are not all that well known. J. Clyde Wolf. He was pretty much a one and done, and he was a retired Navy enlisted. For some reason, he had classified information. What's interesting to me about this one is that the Navy didn't even know it was missing. Usually, when you steal documents, you'll copy it. You won't physically take the documents, or else you'll return it. He just took it. And no one noticed it was missing. The FBI learned about it later on. What he tried to do was he simply tried to sell the document that he had. He didn't have a whole lot, and he just didn't, you know, he was, and, he, and he didn't want a whole lot of money either. So this is what he did. He basically, you know, tried or considered selling it, and the FBI was tipped off, and he was, you know, he got five years in prison. All right. Below, Robert Ernest Cordry, C O R D R E Y. He was a Marine NBC instructor. What is NBC? Anybody know? Nuclear Biological Chemical. Nuclear Biological Chemical, right. He was a Marine Corps instructor that dealt with you know, how the Marine Corps handled this, classified documents. He decides he's going to sell it to the Soviet bloc. And uh, he was caught, obviously, as he got hard labor. These are lesser known stories. OK. This one is pretty interesting. Thomas Patrick Cavanaugh. This guy is one of the few guys that's still in jail. And he could have potentially done a lot of damage. That's a, a stealth bomber. Okay. He worked as a Northrop aerospace engineer. And this guy was in real trouble financially. I mean, real trouble. He had like thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars in debt. You know, he was being divorced. Uh, he maybe even was divorced, and he just didn't know what to do. So he decides, you know, that he's going to sell information on the stealth bomber, and he was caught in a sting operation. You know, they, he tried, he approached, you know, who he thought was a Soviet agent. It turned out to be an FBI agent. He was caught at, LA, at the L.A. airport, you know, having a meeting. And it's been argued that had he passed on what he knew about the stealth bomber, we would have been in a world of hurt. But he's one that fortunately we, we caught in the nick of time. Okay, Jeffrey Carney, uh, nicknamed Kid. Jeffrey Carney was an Air Force linguist, German, that basically defected to the other side. He became a Stasi agent. Stasi is the East German police, okay, or the, the East German secret police. Jeffrey Carney was just a disgruntled, uh, he had some issues. Uh, he didn't like Air Force life, he didn't like Reagan's policies, and he was a homosexual. And in the mid-1980s, that was not a good thing to be when you were in the military. 
So he just decided, he was in Germany at the time, in, in Berlin, and he just decides to cross over and talk to the East Germans, and he ends up, he ends up becoming a spy, you know, working for them. And they eventually encouraged him to relocate to Goodfellow Air Force Base in Texas, which is a school they send you to after you go to your language school in Monterey. So he was there for a while, and then he decides to defect. So he just leaves, and he got away with it. We didn't even know what happened to him. He was just AWOL. We learned later on that he actually was, you know, an East German spy. When, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, you know, you have the reunification of Germany. We now have access to the Stasi records. That's how we learned he was a spy. What we actually did was we sent in a team and we brought him out. He was rearrested. Apparently, the German government wasn't even aware of it, that we went in and got him out. The most interesting thing about him, though, is that he would get a medal. This is really interesting. Basically, what happened was, after he'd been arrested, remember, he's a deserter, so now that he's back in, he's going to undergo you know, military justice, he's assigned, he's assigned to a certain unit. It's the Gulf War. You know, we decide to liberate the Kuwait from Iraq, you know, from Iraq, you know, Saddam Hussein. The unit he's assigned to gets a National Defense Service Medal for their performance in the Gulf War. He gets a medal, <laughs> even though he had nothing to do with it. True story. <laughs> Jeffrey Carney. He got 38 years in jail, only had 11. I don't know if I can put up 11 fingers here, so I'm not even going to bother. <laughs> okay, another one here. Poland. Okay, Marion Zakarski, that's the young guy there on the left, and William Holden Bell. William Holden Bell was a project manager for used aircraft, and he just ran into a bunch of bad luck all at once. You know, he had a, a disaster involving one of his children who was getting a divorce. You know, it's, it's the old, you know, when it rains, it pours. He was just in dire straits all of a sudden. This young guy here, Marian Zakarski, is the head of a machinist union, and he also works for Polish intelligence. And I think you know where this is going. Marian becomes his best friend, you know, they're tennis buddies and all this other kind of stuff, other kind of stuff. And uh, William Holden Bell passes on sensitive information about used aircraft, you know, the radar, uh, to, to Zakarski. Okay, the FBI gets wind of this. They're both under. You know, they're, they're both being watched. Bell is arrested, and he just, and they convince him to turn on Zakarski. So Zakarski ends up, Bell gets eight years in jail. Zakarski gets a life sentence. Zakarski is exchanged in 1985 in a prisoner swap. So that's the Polish flag. All right, another one of my favorite ones, Samuel Loring Morrison. Okay, uh, Samuel Loring Morrison worked for the Office of Naval Intelligence, and he, his area of expertise was the Soviet military ships. What a surprise, Office of Naval Intelligence. As a part-timer, he also worked for Jane's Defense Weekly, you know, which is a British magazine that focuses on the militaries of the world. What he decides to do is to give Jane's Defense Weekly satellite photos of Soviet ships, our satellite photos. And this is one of them here. This is a Soviet aircraft carrier, the, uh, the Baku, B-A-K-U. Okay. His rationale for this is that I'm providing a public service. You know, there's no reason this should be classified. And, of course, he's making that decision himself. And, of course, you can't have that. So he's arrested. He's the first ever convicted under the 1917 Espionage Act, the World War I Act, or, or, or said simpler, he was the first one, the first government employee ever arrested and convicted for leaking material to the press. He fought it. He only got a two-year sentence, but he's not happy, so he fights it. The Supreme, I think it was the Supreme Court. It was one of, you know, one of the higher-level courts. Basically, you know, upholds the decision. So he, you know, now he's a criminal, basically has a criminal record. He has friends in high places. The British government was not happy because they didn't think what he did was so bad. 
and Senator, Senator Patrick Moynihan, Daniel Patrick Moynihan in New York, basically intervenes and decides that uh, Samuel Loring Morrison got a raw deal and persuades President Clinton to <laughs> give him a pardon. You know, presidents, as we know, give pardons usually on the last day of office. You know, you always wonder why. They, you know, some are real head scratchers. The CIA was really unhappy when Clinton did this. But there's more to the Samuel Morrison, the uh, Loring Morrison story. His grandfather was a really, really well-known naval historian, Samuel Elliott Morrison, a guy that I'm familiar with. He basically wrote the naval history of World War II for the United States. But he's a very, very well-known historian. His grandson, Samuel Loring Morrison, would be arrested later for trying to steal documents about, about his grandfather from the Naval Archives. So he was arrested again later on. And Samuel Loring Morrison is dead now, and he's buried at, Ar at Arlington National Cemetery. <laughs> so, you know, again, even spies can end up, you know, in Arlington National Cemetery. Okay. This one just looks like a spy. We I mean, got the French coats. Okay, this is a Carl Frantisek coacher, the guy in the middle. Okay, anyone want to take a guess as to what country he spied for? You can probably tell by the name. Czechoslovakia. Yes, he was a Czech intelligence officer, Carl Frantisek coacher. He defected uh, to the United States, and of course he was a double agent. He was actually working for Czechoslovakia. And he got hired by the CIA, and he worked for the CIA for about 10 years. And he, you know, he was, he was caught, and uh, they were never able to arrest him because they didn't have enough on him. Rudy, John, Rudy Giuliani, a name that I know many of you are familiar with, actually tried to bust him, convict him, but was unsuccessful. He ends up being exchanged in a prisoner swap <laughs> later on. So he was never actually arrested, but we knew he was a spy and we managed to pass him on in a, in a prisoner exchange. The woman next to him, uh, she, they tried to get her to uh, turn evidence against him, but she refused. And the other guy there is an author, you know, uh, Ronald Kessler. But that's just a great picture there because, you know, it looks nothing smacks of espionage and Cold War politics more than that. Okay. <laughs> We've got one more and then we're done here. Okay, Clayton Lone Tree. This one is actually not 1985, as I say on the slide. I remember when this happened. This was a big deal. Clayton Lone Tree was a Marine security guard at the Soviet Embassy. That is not an easy job to get. So he's highly trained. And it wasn't just him, by the way. There were a couple of other uh, guards there that basically were involved in fraternization. With the, with the local women. And some of these women were working at the U.S. Embassy. One of them was Violetta Siena. I'm sure I'm not pronouncing it right. She operated the telephone and she did some secretarial type of work. She was a KGB agent, so they developed a relationship. And to make a long story short, you know, the, the KGB is given access to the embassy at night and things like that. And he would later go on to, the, to, to be with the U.S. Embassy in Austria. He turned himself in, you know, he realized he screwed up. And he was given a 30-year sentence, and it was eventually, you know, shortened to 15. And he's out now. He was a Native American, too, which was part of the, maybe perhaps why it was, you know, high profile. He was a, a Winnebago and a Navajo, that combination. All right. <laughs> So basically, that is the, the cases that I've that that I covered. I'm aware that there are other ones that are pretty high profile. Uh, Robert Hansen, for example, the guy that's that spied for the F, you know, FBI agent that decided to work for the Soviet Union. Alder James from the CIA. Uh, Anna Montez, you know, who just got out of jail recently. She spied for Cuba because she didn't like our policy. Those were later on. I mean, you know, I'm trying to basically restrict it to a certain time period. Okay, so a lot of the information that I provided to you, not all of it, but a lot of it at least, comes from this particular document. And basically case summaries from 1975 to 2008, and it was put out by that organization that was created by, that was recommended by the Stillwell Commission, 
the Defense Personnel Security Records Center. So if you want this particular study, you know, just let me know. That's my contact information there. I also have a card. I need to mention as well that uh, if you want other material from my office, and we're it's all available to the public, just go to www.nsa.gov and simply just find the history section. And we have all kinds of things that are available to you to, to, to read on, to read about. The Enigma machine, for example, we have a book on that. I gave a presentation a few years back on the Enigma machine. This is all available to the public. So I need to put in a commercial for my own, for my organization as well. Okay, so what do we learn from this? Basically, one of the things that I learned is that a, a, a life sentence is not a life sentence. You know, that's the cynical part of the way of looking at it. Okay. Basically, do spies, do, do, well, does every spy get caught? No. Some of them get away with it, but mostly they don't. What's interesting about this is that it's really, in the case of a spy, it's hard to be a spy in the sense that your faith is not in your own hands. All it takes is someone to turn you in. You can do everything right, you can be the world's greatest spy, and still get caught. Some of these people were caught when they retired. Some of them do get away. But generally, they, they don't. At least this is my view on it as well. So, it, it, you know, give me something to think about. This was just, uh, these cases are very entertaining. And every one of them is a little different. And you just wonder, you know, what these people are thinking. But again, money was, was clearly the motive. And some of these people were just like desperate. They really were. This certainly doesn't defend them at, at all. But it does, you know, being desperate like this makes you do things you never thought you would do. All right, we talked a little over an hour. Huh, a little longer than I thought it would. Okay, is there any further questions?